This is the Little Red Video. Harvey Penix lessons from a lifetime in golf. Now your host, Dave Marr. Hi, I'm Dave Marr. One of the most meaningful traditions in golf is that of student and teacher. Wisdom passed along from the game's experienced players to its youth. Bobby Jones learned from Stuart Maiden. Jack Nicklaus learned from Jack Grout. And in Austin, Texas, Ben Crenshaw and Tom Kite learned golf from Harvey Penick. It was a great thrill for me to win the 1965 PGA Championship. It was also a thrill to learn that Harvey told his young players to imitate my swing. That's high praise indeed. There are a number of top pros, men and women, who Harvey Penick polished up and sent out on tour. Tournament winners like Betsy Rawls, Sandra Palmer, Kathy Whitworth, Mickey Wright, the Massingale brothers, Don and Rick. But Harvey Penick also spends his time teaching beginners, intermediates, low handicappers, and hackers, players of all skill levels and all walks of life. Harvey's special gift is teaching people to enjoy the game he loves so dearly. For decades, he jotted down his insights and observations about the game into a notebook, never showing his literary nuggets to anyone but his son, Tinsley. Not until last year, when he sat down with Texas author Bud Schrake and produced Harvey Penick's Little Red Book, which has since become the best-selling sports book of all time. Notice I didn't say golf book. I said sports book. The Little Red Book is an instant classic, a priceless treasure, something that will endure. And it's a story told as only Harvey Penny can tell it in his own words. If you want discourses on swing planes, angles of attack, degrees of bend in the spine, sorry, Harvey's not your guy. He communicates in simple, direct language. Golf instruction without the jargon. So sit back and relax. And with a little help from two of his most famous pupils, Ben Crenshaw and Tom Kite, we're gonna take you inside the Little Red Book. Now before we get into the nuts and bolts, I want you to get to know Harvey a little better. This great gentleman has devoted his life to the game of golf. Over the years, he's helped countless golfers learn to play their best and in doing so, touch their lives. He's a man of character and integrity, motivated solely by a love of golf and a love of teaching. He is universally respected and his stature in the golf world is such that the Teacher of the Year Award given by the Golf Teachers Association is called the Harvey Penick Award. And the PGA has named him one of golf's legendary teachers. Oh, I'm interested in anything that's gonna help people play golf. He is as patient and as solid as those oak trees out there. I mean, he's there every day. And the only thing that makes him happy is for people to enjoy golf. Brian Nelson and I had a talk when he was at, at the top. While taping this program, we had an unexpected it. stroke of luck. And Harvey had never let his two most famous pupils, the 1984 so Masters champion Ben Crenshaw and the 1992 U.S. Bad. Open champion and all-time leading money winner Tom Kite, watch each other take lessons. He didn't want them to overhear something that didn't apply to their games. But when we brought the three of them together for a photo shoot, the talk turned to golf. Two extremely talented students talking golf with the master teacher. See, the thing that's that's interesting about Mr. Penny's teaching is that he doesn't differentiate between the high handicap player and the and the good player in what he's trying to do. I mean, it's still the same thing. He's not teaching a 36 handicap a particular swing and then teaching Tom Kite and Ben Crenshaw another type of swing. Uh, he's trying to improve that 36 handicap swing uh, to make it as as good as it can be. Harvey likes to say he's seen more balls hit than anyone. So it's no surprise that he understands the mechanics of the golf swing. What sets Harvey apart is his unique ability to communicate. He knows what to say, and more importantly, how to say it. 
he is a genius in the way that he conveys his thoughts. People look at some of those things and they just, it's laughingly simple. You know, they say, well, that's absurd, it's so simple. But when they go out and try it, it works. And when you take a lesson from Harvey, you get more than some tips on the golf swing. Yeah, you know, just hanging around Mr. Penick was always such a positive experience. You, you, you never came away from a lesson without feeling better about yourself, better about your game than, uh, than you did before. Perhaps the key to Harvey Penick is that he really cares. I played uh, on tour for some two, three years and, and uh, had a few good tournaments, but I was very lost. And I came back and uh, uh, I came back and we, he said, all right, let's go up and watch a few. And uh, he could tell by the third ball, you know, that I was lost. And about the fifth or sixth ball, he, he put his arm on me like I'd never seen him do before. And he said, Ben, he said, don't ever wait this long to come back to see me. And that's good advice for the rest of us as well. Don't ever wait too long to come and see Harvey. Watch this tape over and over. Learn the lessons Harvey learned from a lifetime in golf. He teaches in stories, images, and metaphors. His language is simple and direct, the meaning clear. If you uh, abide by the, the maxims that Harvey has in the book and in the video, that uh, uh, there's no question you will be able to, in, to improve your game. Uh, uh, this man did not become the best teacher that the game of golf has ever known without knowing a little bit about it. Harvey spent a lot of time working with his students on their grips. You know, he said, if, if you don't have a good grip, you don't want to play good golf. It can't be more clear than that. I think that so many times we, we vastly underestimate the importance of the grip. But one grip does not fit all. The interlocking grip with the forefinger of the top hand laced between the little finger and the ring finger of the bottom hand is for people with short fingers, used by Tom Kite, Gene Sarazen, and Jack Nicklaus. The overlapping grip with the little finger of the bottom hand wrapped into the hollow between the forefinger and middle finger of the top hand are on top of the left forefingers the most widely used among ordinary players as well as experts, though with many individual variations. Ben Crenshaw, Ben Hogan, Arnold Palmer, Byron Nelson, Sam Sneed, and Payne Stewart are just a few of the overlappers, and none of their grips are exactly alike. The two-hand or ten-finger grip with all the fingers on the handle, sometimes called the baseball grip, although the baseball bat is held more in the palms and a golf club more in the fingers, is especially good for women and older players who may lack strength. Although some top professionals like Beth Daniel, Art Wall, and Bob Rosberg have done quite well with it. Okay, so how should you place your hands on the golf club to achieve a good grip? Well, most modern teachers like to talk about aligning the V's formed by your thumb and forefinger. Harvey has a simpler suggestion. Just pick up a yardstick and fit your hands to it and swing it. Then put the same grip on a golf club. The idea in the grip is to, is to have your hands opposing each other. Uh, if you, you know, put your left hand up there like that and your right hand like that, and then you just close them around, then, then you have a pretty good grip. And the thing that the yardstick does, it gives you a flat side. So when you put that yardstick in your hand, it, it aligns with the palm of your left hand. Then you wrap it around and it stays square. And then it aligns with the palm of your right hand, you wrap it around and stay square. Whatever grip you choose, Harvey wants you to pay attention to the position of your left thumb. Rather than straight down the top of the handle, the left thumb should be over a little bit to the right. The reason is at the top of the backswing, that thumb wants to be underneath the club. This gives you control. Here's another key thought. The hands must be touching each other. They should be joined together as a unit they should feel like they are melted together. The best thing to do, find a grip that fits you and feels good and then stay with it. If the ball is flying pretty well, your grip is all right.
Here's a simple image to help you with your stance. Harvey wants you to face the ball plane as if you were about to shake hands with somebody on the other side of it. There is no need to get your body twisted into some kind of funny shape. Key thing to the stance is that he wanted you to be in balance. That's the, that's the number one thing. He, uh, he never promoted a really wide stance uh, because it inhibited motion, inhibited movement, and didn't allow you to be able to swing the golf club in an effortless uh, way. Uh, and yet at the same time, he knew that too narrow a stance didn't promote enough balance to be able to swing your arms fast without falling off balance. Um, so he, he kind of gave you a little compromise there. He wasn't too keen on, on uh, the turning out of the left toe and the squaring up of the right toe. Uh, he kind of wanted you to, to stand just like you normally stand. Um, you know, if you're a little pigeon-toed, he didn't mind you being a little pigeon-toed. If, if your feet turned out a little bit, he kind of wanted them to turn out. He didn't really want you to twist or turn. He wanted you to be as normal as possible. If you want to close your stance, Pull your right foot back a few inches from the line and turn your hips and shoulders to fit it. To open your stance, pull your left foot back a few inches from the line and let your hips and shoulders go with it. When you stand to the ball, just flex your knees a little as if you were making the first move towards sitting down. Be comfortable and at ease, not straining anything. Position of the ball is second in importance only to the grip. Mistakes in the grip and ball position are mistakes made before the swing that may ruin any grand plans you have for the shot. Many instructors teach that the ball should be played off the left heel for all shots. Harvey disagrees. Nowadays, the golf courses are so well manicured that um, uh, I think he's a little bit more forgiving uh, with the ball position than, uh, than he used to be. But he still likes you to be able to hit down on the ball. He doesn't like, uh, he doesn't like that ball so far forward that it, that it uh, encourages a lot of lateral motion uh, to where you actually move in front of the ball to, or move to get up to the ball, should I say. Um, uh, he wants you to be able to try to keep your body as still as possible and, and still hit down on it. He wants you to play your nine iron from the dead center of your stance, then move forward as you go to longer clubs. To illustrate, note the ball position for the six iron and the three iron. The driver and three wood are the only clubs you want to play off your left heel. This is because you want to hit the ball slightly on the upswing or at the lowest point of the swing with these clubs. His 70 years in teaching gave Harvey a rare wisdom. He liked to say, if you play poorly one day, forget it. Play poorly the next time out. Review your fundamentals of grip, stance, aim and ball position because most mistakes are made before the club is swung. If you play poorly for a third time in a row, go see your professional. But be careful. If your pro asks you to take an aspirin, please don't take the whole bottle. In the golf swing, a tiny change can make a huge difference. The natural inclination is to begin to overdo the tiny change that has brought success. So you exaggerate in an effort to improve even more, and soon you are lost and confused again. Lessons are not to take the place of practice, but to make practice worthwhile. To start a golf swing, you need a forward press of some sort that sets off the action. To help you understand this concept, Harvey wants you to imagine you're in a stance holding a bucket of water. If you're gonna swing this bucket back like a golf back swing, you just naturally won't do it from a dead stop because that produces a jerky motion. Instead, your hands and hips and shoulders and legs will rock slightly forward to provide the reaction that gives momentum to the back swing. 
This starts the turn and the shift of the weight to the right foot that you would need to swing a bucket of water. If you're gripping the bucket tightly, you will turn fast. If your grip is light, your turn will be slow and free. To bring the bucket back down, you wouldn't throw it with your hands. You would shift your weight to the left foot and stay behind the bucket as you swing it down and through. If you want, hold the bucket with two hands. The idea is the same. And you can picture the release of power as the bucket reaches the forward swing and the water flies out. This is probably a good time for a note on tempo and timing. If you are to get best results, you can't rush your swing. If it's a nice, smooth, rhythmic takeaway, your hands, your, your swing at the top will be more together and you'll, you'll be more likely to, to have a, a nice turn and everything starts back down and the cha when you change directions, it'll be smoother. He impressed that on me way early to try to be patient off the ball, very patient off the ball. It goes right in line with Jones' thinking when he said nobody ever swung the club away from the ball too slowly. Of all the thousands of swing training aids and gimmicks on the market, the best one you can buy is at the hardware store if you don't already have it in your garage or tool shed. It is the common weed cutter. Many years ago, Victor East, the genius behind Spalding Clubs, sent six weed cutters to Harvey and six to Wild Bill Melhorn, who was teaching at a club in Florida. A few weeks later, Melhorn sent his weed cutters back to Victor with a note that said, these things are ruining my business. As soon as you use them, don't need me anymore. The motion you make lopping off dandelions with your weed cutter is the perfect action of swinging a golf club through the hitting area. Furthermore, the weed cutter is heavy and builds golf muscle. And while you're swinging the weed cutter, pretend you're being paid by the hour, not by the job. In other words, take your time. Harvey is one of the rare teachers who's enjoyed great success with players of both genders. Tom Kite and Ben Crenshaw, Mickey Wright and Kathy Whitworth. So pay attention when he talks about the sexes. Said Harvey, no pretty woman can miss a single shot without a man giving her some poor advice. A husband should never try to teach his wife to play golf or drive a car. And a wife should never try to teach her husband to play bridge. Modern teachers want the students to keep the left heel on the ground throughout the swing. The old school teachers like Percy Boomer and the great Scottish pros want the left heel to come up and return to the ground at the start of the downswing. Harvey is from the old school, not because it produces a more classic swing, which it does, but because letting the left heel come up is the best way to get the job done. Harvey likes to say, let the left heel come up if it wants to. What a wonderful image. The important thing is that you do not consciously lift the left heel. You keep the left heel on the ground, but you let it come up naturally as you make your backswing. Let it come up if it wants to. Thereby, it's what's inside of you making that thing go. And that's the kind of, that's the kind of thing that, that uh, Harvey feels right in saying. The turn away from the ball and back through it again is a simple movement that has been made to seem complicated by different teaching theories and personal idiosyncrasies. As Horton Smith would say, the turn is just like that old song children used to sing. And the ankle bone connected to the knee bone, the knee bone connected to the hip bone, the hip bone connected to the backbone, the backbone connected to the shoulder bone. Now hear the word of the Lord. Harvey says, keep it simple. Stand erect with your knees slightly flexed and your eyes on the ball. Think of the bucket image to start your forward press. Turn your body to the right with your weight shifting up to your right foot and let your left heel come up about an inch. The turn is really a simple motion. It's like turning to say howdy to someone on your right. Your arms keep swinging until the shaft is behind you and pointing to the target. 
you know, he always felt like that the uh, the body did the turning and the arms did the did the lifting. Uh, the arms provided the vertical part of the swing, and the body provided the the rotational part of the golf swing. And and uh, uh, you know, it's it's nothing more than than standing up and having somebody behind you and, and saying, okay. Uh, uh, you know, say somebody was behind me and they called out, hey, Tom, and I'd just kind of go, yeah. And I'd look around, there's the body turn. And then you put a little arm swing with it, and all of a sudden you're in perfect position at the top of your gas swing. You will read and hear many complex instructions about the turn. Coiling the torso and shoulders against the tension of the hips, for example, but not from Harvey. Just remember, the turn is a natural movement of the body, and your bones are connected from the ground up. When Harvey says bring your right arm down back to your side, he means on the downswing. Harvey has seen students with all sorts of weird ideas they've been taught. They try to swing with a towel or a head cover under their right armpit. The right elbow is practically strapped to the body. The result, a swing that is too short and flat. Let your right elbow go back freely, but return it to your side when you start back to the ball. That's all there is to it. An average golfer was pestering Tommy Armour to teach him how to put backspin on his iron shots. The obvious answer is that if you hit the ball solidly, the loft on the club will put backspin on it. But this was too simple. The golfer was sure Tommy must know some secret that made a good middle iron shot land on the green and dance backward. Finally, Tommy said, let me ask you something. When you hit an approach shot from 140 yards or so, are you usually past the pin or are you usually short of it? I'm nearly always short of the pin, the golfer replied. Tommy said, then what do you need with backspin? To play good golf, you want to learn to stay behind the ball because that's where you get your power. Now, there's a lot of talk about keeping the head still, but there isn't a champion in the game who doesn't move his head during the swing. Let's take a look at Ben Crenshaw in slow motion. Now here's Tom Kite. See what we mean? A good player lets his head move slightly backward before and during impact, never forward. But before you can stay behind the ball, you must get behind it. Harvey wants you to set up with your head behind the ball and keep your head behind the ball. Notice how both Crenshaw and Kite are behind the ball prior to impact. This is the key. If there is such a thing as a magic move, it's an action that Harvey stresses over and over on the practice tee and in his book. To start your downswing, let your weight shift to your left foot while bringing your right elbow down to your body. This is one move, not two. Practice this move again and again. You don't need a golf club to do it. Practice until you get the feeling and rhythm of it, and then keep on practicing. Be sure your eyes are trained on the spot where the ball would be your head will stay well back. Here is how Harvey wants you to make the mythical perfect swing that all golfers are always pursuing. Stand a few paces behind the ball and look down the line toward the target. Walk to the ball from behind, get a good grip, pass the club back of the ball square to the target, then adjust your stance to fit. Have a slight waggle and then set the club back of the ball again and make a forward press similar to what you would do swinging a bucket of water. In the first move back as the club gets parallel to the ground, the toe of the club points directly up and the left heel starts off the ground. Let the club come on up, keeping your elbows in front of your body to the top of your backswing where the club head will be pointing almost to the ground. Return your left heel to the ground and simultaneously let your right elbow move back to your side as it comes down. 
Weight has started shifting to the left side. Your forearms cross over as they swing. Your head stays behind the ball and perhaps even moving slightly more behind it. Finish with your forearms in front of you. A good finish shows what has gone before it. Let your head come up to look at the good shot. On your follow through, the right foot merely helps you hold your balance. If you have lost your balance during this mythical perfect swing, it is probably because your grip is too weak or too tight or both. Practice this at home in slow motion without a ball. Be sure you don't watch the club head go back. Swing the club head at a spot every time. Force yourself to approach the ball from behind before every swing, even on the carpet. Make 10 to 20 mythical perfect swings each night, teaching your muscles what your brain wants. Using a weighted club during this exercise can be even more beneficial. When Harvey's student Betsy Rawls was in a playoff for the U.S. Women's Open Championship, Harvey sent her a one-sentence telegram that said simply, take dead aim, Betsy won the playoff. For golfers who might not understand Texas talk, what Harvey means is shut out all thoughts other than picking out a target and taking dead aim at it. Once you address the golf ball, hitting it has got to be the most important thing in your life at that moment. Think positively, block out all distractions, a golf swing happens right now, not in the past or in the future. Harvey wants you to believe with all your heart that the shot you're about to hit will be a good one. He wants you to have total confidence, take dead aim. A high handicapper will be surprised at how often the man will make the muscles hit the ball to the target, even with a less than perfect swing. The expert player won't be surprised. He expects to hit the target. Take dead aim. This is Harvey's most important advice. Forget how your swing may look and concentrate on where you want the ball to go. Pretty is as pretty does, and this is a great way to calm down a case of nerves. Take dead aim. Don't just do it from time to time when you happen to remember. Make it a point to do it on every shot. Take dead aim. He says that, that when you're getting ready to play a golf shot, the most important thing in your life at that particular moment has to be playing that golf shot. And when you really think about take that aim, it takes your, it takes your mind off of your swing. Because you, I, I don't think there's anybody who has ever played golf who has ever hit a really wonderful golf shot and, you know, you, you either, you, after it's happened, you know, you pick up your bag and you start walking down the fairway and they say, well, how did that shot happen? Why was that shot so good? What thoughts were going through my head when, it, when we hit that ball? Usually nothing. You're, it was subconscious. It was usually because you really picked out that target and you let the thing happen. It was a reaction. And it all just felt wonderfully sublime. And why is it when we don't play well that our mind is so cluttered with all of this garbage that, that, that is an interference? It's probably somewhere along the line we forgot to take dead aim. Take dead aim, even on the shorter shots. But how can you tell where you are aimed? Harvey wants you to take your stance and hold the club shaft along the front of your thigh. Look where the club is pointing and you'll see where you are aimed. Laying the club on the ground at your feet will tell you very little. Take dead aim, you'll be pleased with the results. Herbert Warren Wynn, the stylish and learned golf writer, came to see Harvey at the club and asked what he thought were the three most important clubs in the bag in order. Harvey said the putter, the driver, and the wedge. Herb said he'd ask Ben Hogan the same question. Ben had replied, the driver, the putter, and the wedge. I agree with Harvey. You hit the driver 14 times in an ordinary round, 
but on the same day, you may have 23 to 25 putts that are outside the gimme range, but within a makeable distance. A five foot putt counts one stroke, the same as a 270 yard drive, but the putt may be much more significant to your score. Psychologically, the driver is very important. If you hit the tee ball well, it fills you with confidence. On the other hand, if you smash a couple of drives into the trees, your confidence can be shaken. But nothing is more important psychologically than knocking putts into the hole. Sinking putts makes your confidence soar and it devastates your opponent. A good putter is a match for anyone. A bad putter is a match for no one. And the woods are full of long drivers. Many golfers are not sure which part of their club face is striking the ball. Harvey's got a simple way to find out. Take a can of talcum powder with you when you practice. Powder the ball, hit it, Look at the club face, you'll know immediately. Here's another of Harvey's great mental images. When you hit your driver, don't think about hitting the ball. Instead, merely clip the tee. Try it. Don't hit the ball, just clip the tee. This will take the club straight through and you'll be pleased with the results clip that tee with those wooden clubs. I remember him saying that distinctly. Uh, it's a very simple phrase, and it gives one an idea of what we're trying to do with a wood shot, and that is, it's a sweeping blow. No, this tape has not been slowed down. You're watching Ben perform Harvey's slow motion drill. You can do this drill on the range or at home. It takes much patience and many repetitions, but the time you spend with it will pay off on the course. When Harvey says slow motion, he means really slow, slow motion. If you think you're doing it in slow motion, hey, do it even slower. Swing your club to the top of the backswing. As you reach the top of the backswing, replace your left heel solidly on the ground and at the very same time, bring your right elbow in close to your body, very, very slowly. Bring the club down in an extreme slow motion, about one third of the way toward the ball. Then stop a moment and hold it and feel it. Do this four times in a row. Don't get impatient and speed up. Very slowly is the key. The average golfer does not improve stroke by stroke. Improvement comes in plateaus. The higher your score, the faster you can lower it with the short game. There's no mystery to it. Anybody who plays much golf knows that about half of his shots are struck within 60 yards of the flag stick. And yet when I see an average golfer practicing, where is he? Most likely he is on the range banging away with his driver. If you ask a golfer what percentage of his time he spends on his short game in comparison to hitting the longer shots, he'll probably tell you that he gives the short game 10 or 20 percent. This is usually a fib. The average golfer will devote 15 minutes to stroking a few putts if he has the time before he heads for the first tee. And that's about it for the short game practice. Well, if you want to see a radical improvement in your game and cut off five strokes in a week or two, you must make a radical change in the way you practice. For two weeks, devote 90% of your practice time to chipping and putting and only 10% to the full swing. If you do this, your 95 will turn into 90. Harvey guarantees it. It's boring. It is boring to, to roll a ball. Uh, it really is, and yet that's the most important thing, is to be able to roll it and roll it the right distance and, and get it online, uh, be it a chip shot or a, or a putt. Uh, the chipping and putting is hard work. That's, that's the work of it, but uh, that's where all the rewards are. When I'm practicing, I try to hit bunker shots every day. I try to hit putts for at least 
uh, 30 minutes and usually an hour a day. Try to hit chip shots, a little wedges every day. Try to hit some distance wedges, you know, the 30, 40, 50 yard uh, wedges so that I can uh, take advantage of the par fives. And, uh, you know, I, I really focus in on that, that area inside 100 yards. So if you want to knock five shots off your game in a hurry, leave your long clubs in the bag and head for the green. Bobby Jones said the secret of shooting low scores is the ability to turn three shots into two. Emerson said, thinking is the hardest work in the world. That's why so few of us do it. Too many golfers think chipping and putting is hard work. That's why so few of them do it. Practice your bunker game to become more aggressive with it. If you learn good fundamentals and practice them, playing a ball out of a greenside bunker is not a difficult shot. Here's how Harvey wants you to do it. First, grip your sand wedge high on the handle as you would for a normal iron shot. This encourages you to take a full swing all the way to a high follow through without quitting on the shot when the club strikes the sand. Play the ball with the shaft pointing at your zipper and your hands slightly ahead. Take a square stance and open your club face so that it points right of the target. Then open your stance by moving your left foot back and taking your hips and shoulders with it so that now your body is aimed left of the target, but the club face has come around to aim straight at it. Shift a little more weight onto the left foot than on the right. Now make a basically normal swing along the line established by your shoulders and body. Hit three or four inches behind the ball and clip the sand out from beneath it. The ball will come out and land on the green in a spray of sand. You're using the bounce of the sand wedge by opening up the face. You're setting yourself left so you don't have to pick the club up to the outside and chop cross it to, uh, to get your outside end swing. Uh, and all you're doing is just like I said, just taking a nice shallow cut out from under the ball. Very simple, very simple. It, uh, it's so simple, it's scary. You know, anybody ought to be able to play decent bunker shots. Practice this shot for a few hours, and you'll become an aggressive bunker player. You won't need to worry again about merely escaping from the bunker somehow. You will be shooting at the pin. The first and foremost fundamental to learn about chipping is this. Keep your hands ahead of or even with the club head on the follow through. All the way through. Grip your club down close to the steel and flex your knees so you can get down to it and keep the club near to you instead of reaching out for the ball. Move your weight a little more to your left foot. Loosen your elbows. Remember that you're hitting the ball with your hands, not with your elbows. Make your backswing and your follow through approximately the same length. Use the straightest face club that will carry the ball onto the green the soonest and start it rolling toward the cup. The sooner you get the ball rolling, the better ch chance you have. Uh, you know, I've, I've been known for my wedges, and yet when I get up around the greens, uh, especially just a few yards off the green, I almost never play a wedge unless it's out of the really deep rough. Uh, I'm, I'm playing a, a club that will allow me to roll the ball. If you're having trouble with your chips, Harvey's got the cure. I think that it help 90% of the once a week players is to feel like that chip shot is going to go underneath the table or underneath the, uh, something uh, like a bench. Had a fella come down from Ohio one time, came all the way for less than chipping. And I put a bench out there after he'd hit a few, and I started hitting them good. After that, hit them over. I said, well, that's the lesson. He got his clubs, went back to Ohio. High handicappers should use their putters from off the green whenever it looks feasible. They'll generally get closer to the hole this way. Just as in chipping, 
The first and foremost fundamental to learn about the putting stroke is keep the hands even with or ahead of the blade of the putter on the follow through. And it's very important that you hit the ball squarely. He taught me early on that, that the, the best way to be a consistent putter is to keep hitting the ball squarely. Now, someone would say, well, that's earth shattering, you know, but it's like taking a dead aim. I'll say this, a thought process of trying to hit that ball squarely should be just as much on your mind as thinking about what happens to a putt as it gets to the hole. Harvey has a simple system to take the mystery out of putting. Read your line from behind the ball. Walk to the ball from behind and take your stance with your hands slightly ahead of the ball or straight up. Glance at the hole and glance at your putter blade to make sure it is square to your line. Now take one, two, or three practice strokes concentrating on each one as if you're trying to make the putt. Harvey likes to see the stroke start with a small forward press. Use the swing the bucket image. Then keep your head and eyes still and imitate your last practice stroke. One great value to this system is that it puts your mind on the stroke and not on the importance of the putt. Hit the putt as you've hit 10,000 putts in the past. Concentrate on imitating your final practice stroke, not on what will happen if you either miss it or make it. When practicing putting, always choose a level place on the green, or perhaps one that is slightly uphill. Harvey hates the old saying, never up, never in. It's true that a ball that never reaches the cup never goes in, but neither does a ball that goes past it. Harvey likes to see a putt die at the hole. He likes to see it slip into the hole like a mouse. The cup is only one inch wide for the putt that is struck too hard. The cup is four inches wide for a ball that dies at the hole. The main reason a putt is left short is not that you hit the putt too softly, it's that you didn't hit it squarely on the sweet spot. If you want to know where you're hitting your putts, simply use Harvey's powder drill. Harvey Penix used to charge $5 an hour for lessons. And when he was forced by the club to raise his rates, Harvey objected. He said, I use small words, so how can I charge big prices? Well, the wisdom that can be found in this book is priceless indeed. If you put these lessons to work, if you practice Harvey's teachings, you will improve. I guarantee it. You know, when Harvey would watch one of his pupils hit a first-class shot, he would say, I hope that brought you as much pleasure as it did me. Well, we hope this program gives you as much pleasure as it does us. And thank you, Harvey, for all that you've given to the game of golf. You know, Bill Campbell told me one time that he he played a lot of golf with Sam mm -hmm. and he said that he was having trouble one day, he was swinging way too quick and Sam said, he said, why don't you try this? He said, if I gave you a, a little pe little board and a 10 penny nail and, and a hammer, I was going to give you one chance to hit that nail. He said, what would you do? He said, I'd just take a nice deed on it. And he said, I wouldn't go yeah. with that. I'd go, that was, that was a, a nice thought for tempo. Yeah. Mickey went out and he, he bought a hardware store so he could do this thing. This is a Victor East model. Looks, <laughs> <laughs> looks like we need a little bit of uh, work on the grip. It sure did. Victor East model there. This is awesome here though. I yeah. swung this a few times. Man, it, it gets your swing right back. To, yeah. How can something so simple be so darn good? Oh, no. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Mr. Phoenix, thank you for a great day. Thank you.